atmosphere of a speaker is that the two first speakers steal everything you're going to say. And that's what's happened. Thank you. And I'll take questions now. No. Uh, uh, I want to thank you for inviting me, Nitsana, and uh, Robert uh, Feldmeyer for taking such good care of me. Uh, the reason I'm here is primarily because uh, I understood, I believe I understood the significance of what we are trying to do. And in that belief, uh, I think it's necessary that we start the conversation today. I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a legal scholar, though my father wanted me to be one. Uh, that, and he, too, has passed away. That was not going to happen. I, I'm a soldier. And as a soldier, uh, I'm just a man of my experiences, like we all are. This morning, I'm just going to take a few minutes, and I know someone's going to try and give me the hook, but, you know, after all, I'm a retired general. I talk as long as I want. <clears throat> Noted. Uh, but I'll keep it. I'll try and keep it short or within the time frame. I'll talk about three operations that I was on, the impact it had on me, and I'll talk about how when I moved into uh, my last two positions at U.S. Special Operations Command, SOCOM, in Tampa, uh, where I first actually met uh, Benny and Tal Russo and many other good friends now in the IDF, uh, things changed for me. And then to offer the challenge to you all as we work through this inaugural meeting here this week. So as a young, uh, young Special Forces uh, Lieutenant Colonel in charge of a battalion, I was uh, fortunate enough to be on a mission, a United Nations mission in Haiti in 1995. Very unusual that Special Operations Task Force would be under the UN in a peacekeeping uh, stabilization mission. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but we had forces throughout the entire uh, part of Haiti maintaining the stability and under a UN Council Security Council resolution, I think 940, to provide presence patrols and uh, just general presence to provide safe and secure area so they could get on with nation building and to hold free and fair elections, something that I think America and the UN wanted for them that the Haitians didn't necessarily believe in, but it, it's, it's what, we want, what we wanted for them, so we helped provide that. And in there, I understood the rules of engagement had gone from we were going to be an invading force to an intervening force to a stabilizing force. Very, very different. And you had to know about every six months the rules of engagement by which Benny so eloquently spoke to that soldier at the very end with a rifle or a pistol in his hand or her hand has to enforce and react and respond accordingly. So those rules of engagement changed all the time. And the forces coming in and coming out changed all the time. So you had to always understand the implication of even minor word changes because words matter on the end of actions where that young soldier, sailor, airman, or marine is going to act. So that was a big portion of what happened throughout the country, watching and making sure that we understood the impact the rules of engagement had as we interfaced with the population. But we also understood there was no real military force. We were there to really stabilize and help them build a civilian population, civilian police force that would help them get on with the nation building they so desperately need and still need. And by the way, I've got to tell you, Israel, with the, uh, the airfield hospital they set up there, phenomenal. I remember seeing somewhere. I couldn't have been prouder. It was a phenomenal act. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, that was, and, and I actually quietly laughed to myself because the speed by which you did it was envious. Yeah, yeah. Noted, again, noted for us. Moving on, you know, a few years later, that was in 95. Very quickly, we knew as we were tapering down our forces uh, in Haiti, Bosnia in 95 was heating up. And I was fortunate enough to go to Bosnia as a commander, now as a colonel, of a special operations task force that was, as we would say in our world, a, a white, gray, and black operation. So things you can't talk about, things you can sort of muddle through, and things that are openly your mission. And the initial mission was the uh, Joint uh, Commission Observer Mission. We had some Brit forces with us as well. Uh, but we had, we are a NATO command. 
And there it started off as truly uh, peace support, peacekeeping operations to stabilize and get them to stop the genocide and stop, because I remember in 1995 there was massive genocide in Zebranicia. Uh, visited the battery factory and, and, and took a, a good look at what happened there. But there had been some serious killing among you know, the Bosniaks, uh, the Serbs, and the Croatians. Very, very serious and uh, the largest genocide since the Holocaust and not something proudly to point to. So we were there under the guise, but again, we were keeping forces apart and keeping people in containment areas. And the rules of engagement had changed dramatically because there was more, much more of a threat and we were trying to get out ahead of it and stay out ahead of it. And that was an important thing to learn, but we were there under a, a NATO stabilization force mandate. Again, very, very different and a very different use of special operations forces. The rules changed sig significantly enough that again, about I was there for six months and in that six month period, I think we looked at rules of engagement change probably at least three times. My biggest lesson learned on this one was the fact that one lawyer left, and we were working on a, a gray mission, meaning it could have turned either black or white in terms of how we conducted it, and I'll leave it at that for your imagination. And as one lawyer left, and very, he was very reluctant to approve our concept of operation. Literally, he left on a Friday. My new lawyer came in Saturday. And my three-star boss, again, Colonel at the time, three-star boss said, you need to brief the new lawyer up on uh, this operation. I said, has the law, the rules of engagement changed? He said, no, it, they haven't, but the lawyer has changed. And I looked at him quizzically going, you know, are, are we shopping for an opinion here? He said, no, we're not. He said, but this, this lawyer is here because I chose him Again, this is a three-star telling the colonel, no, we're not shopping for an opinion, but I chose him because he's much more pragmatic than the last guy. The last guy was bound to the rules of the law, and this guy knows how to think outside of that. This, I also understood now, as I was becoming more and more akin to having lawyers with me, excuse me, that that's the way it was going to be, that if I wanted to do things, I needed to know not just the operational, tactical, strategic impact, but certainly the legal impact as well. So there, again, a, uh, an environment not necessarily restricted too much, but certainly uh, under the guise of, of NATO and a stabilization force, and I bring that up for a specific reason. The third example, that was 2000, third example very quickly happened right Actually, a day before 9-11 in American history, we were out in uh, Camp Smith, Hawaii. I was uh, the first Special Forces Group commander at Fort Lewis, Washington, and we were getting ready to go to the southern Philippines, a place we'd never been asked to go, and we were going to go there to do an assessment, a strategic, operational, and tactical assessment of the Philippine military because the then commander of U.S. Pacific Command, uh, Admiral Dennis Blair, Denny Blair, was tired of giving the Filipinos things that they just kind of ran into the ground. Helicopters after a year or two wouldn't fly, trucks would just run dry, ships the same way, no maintenance program, no thought about the future. So he was tired of that, his, his words, and he told me, you need to go there and do this. So we were getting ready to do that when we were attacked. And all it did was speed up the process. He then said, you're still gonna go, go home, get ready, you're gonna go, I want you there as soon as possible. We got there in October, and the mission began, uh, actually it began December 2001, and I stayed with that mission off and on in my different positions as I went through the Pacific until I went to SOCOM to about 2007, 2008. So about seven years, six or seven years, I was stayed with that mission, and the mission is now just winding down. But in that mission, uh, we thought we were gonna go in there, and there was a couple things going on. One, we wanted to help the country get back in the good uh, eyes and view of the population, uh, which was very, very distant from them because everybody down there who was not uh, Christian uh, and had been Muslim and not very good Muslims at that decided they, the, 
the country decided, contradictory to their con constitution, that in fact, because they were non-Christian, that they had to be terrorists. So they were painting with too broad of a brush, way too broad of a brush. And what had happened was they had, it become very divisive between the government and the form of the military uh, and the population. But there were also American hostages down there. There were uh, Gracia and Martin Burnham. Uh, they were from, I think, Lenexa or Leewood, Kansas. They were missionaries down there, had been taken hostage uh, earlier that year. And there were some other hostages that were, I think, a Californian, Filipino-American, Oscar Guillermo, and also Deborah Yap, a Filipino nurse. And a few others had either been killed in captivity. I think Guillermo was beheaded because he, had di he was diabetic and could not keep up. So he became a liability, and they beheaded him made something out of that and went on. So it was to do two big things. I thought it was to help the population and the guy I worked for, my one star boss said, no, it's about getting the hostages back. We ended up doing both as you might imagine. But in that circumstances, the rules of engagement, we were ready to go to help them to go side by side with them into combat. And right before we're deploying, the night before they're deploying into the island of Basilan, uh, we were told, no, no, you're going on an exercise. And that, you know, the heart of a soldier goes, I'm doing what? I, I, won't, I won't say exactly, I guess we're filming here, I won't say exactly what I said, <laughs> but I'm a soldier and it kind of came out, you know? <laughs> Unapologetically it came out, yeah. What the, did you say? Yeah, okay. And that's to a one star and a two star a Filipino Marine in, in general. And I just kind of go, you gotta be kidding me. What's this about? Well, their constitution had changed in 1986 and we were there, I was literally on the ground when a lot of the uh, movement on the EDSA had happened. And you know, I knew that they had had a constitutional convention, changed their, their constitution and that foreigners could no longer conduct direct combat operations. So we said, okay, so we're gonna go on an exercise with them to do this. So we're both getting creative with the rule of law, but it was still the rule of law. And the rules of engagement were written in such a way that if we were on a mission with them and we could do something to protect our partners and their equipment, that was a good one, that became broad enough that we could do about anything we needed to do to break that glass to start operating and defending which means in some ways you could almost bait the enemy to, to come along and do something to them so you could bring in everything you needed. But we played very conservatively because, again, you know, the chain of command that I worked for was very, very concerned. Very quickly through the story, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, came to visit. It's a hard trip to get to. I mean, it's a very, very hard place to go. Washington, uh, to Honolulu or Washington, to Narita, Narita down to Manila, and then Manila in to uh, Zamboanga, and then a boat ride or another helicopter ride across the Straits of 12 miles in the Basilan, and there's Paul Wolfowitz. And one of, one of the questions he had, he said, so what do you need from me? Which is always a good thing to ask. And we had a list of things, and it wasn't equipment, we said, look, the rules of engagement said that we can only stay at the battalion level. Battalion level is very, very constraining. That that's all, all where we can go to, to train. He said, so what are you doing about that? And we said, well, the battalion commanders who really want us working with their teams below that level move their battalion headquarters from location to location. And that served the purposes. And he looked and he said, I wish you wouldn't have to get creative like that with the rules of engagement. We go, yes, but because they're so confining, we need a change. And he said, will the change that you're asking for be accepted in Manila? The answer was yes. I said, okay. So he went back and according to legend, he waited until the Secretary of Defense was on leave and he signed the new rules of engagement. Didn't have to explain it and you know, things got much better there. We did recover the hostages, one was alive, Marcia was alive, uh, Martin was dead rather, and Gracia was alive, uh, and uh, the other, uh, Deborah Yap, I think was killed in the firefight as well, I don't know who was killed by whom, but, but we were minorly successful, but we stayed there to deal with the population, again, reviewing the rules of engagement, 
and how they changed routinely. But what struck me as I was getting ready to leave, that we had achieved what we wanted to achieve, yet we stayed there for the population. And they really, you know, the population and the, and the government, in this case, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, got very, very close, and they started to trust one another, something they hadn't had for many, many years. But go back to Haiti. Haiti was under the UN mandate, which is a direct outgrowth of World War II, or and actually World War I, League of Nations failure, and then the America's not joining. But then, so UN mandate, Haiti. NATO, Stabilization Force mandate, certainly coming out of World War II, collective, uh, mutual, uh, collective uh, security arrangements. And then the last part was a think a mutual defense board treaty the Americans have with the Filipinos dating back from uh, the Japanese occupation uh, coming out of World War II as well. So all have to do exactly with what Nisana and Benny have talked about in the way we've all grown up with proportionality and Hugo de Grotius and the rest of them are saying, look, this is the way it's got to be. And that we are tutored in that, we are trained in that, and before anybody ever goes down range, whether it be a Green Beret, Special Forces Detachment, if they're just going on training, they still get training in the law of land warfare every time. We take it extremely serious because we don't know what's going to happen down there. We want them ready. We also give them training on human rights. And if there's a violation, they've got to try and stop it, put themselves at great risk, but they also have to report it right away. That's part of the training every time. And this is what I would ask, even as a three-star, I'd ask, you know, kind of like, you know, Benny touching people, you know, what is going on down there? Is it still the same way? It is. Extremely important. But that was then. I was leaving to become the director for the Center for Special Operations, and now I had global responsibilities. I was very comfortable in the Pacific. I had served 19 out of my 37 and a half years in the Pacific. I was extremely comfortable with the countries, with the different cultures, and what was going on. But now I had global responsibilities as the director for the Center for Special Operations at U.S. Special Operations Command, SOCOM. And I realized what I didn't know, which was, which was grand, phenomenal. So one of the first things I did was to try to get my brain around not what was going on, because we had plenty of guys doing the operational piece. We knew we had task forces and operators in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Philippines and Colombia and everywhere else that we could possibly be. Our Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, was out ahead of the curve doing their bit to understand what was going on as well. But I turned to my staff and I said, you know, SOCOM is really supposed to be about the future, not just about manning and equipping, but about really synchronizing what's going on. Which one of you geniuses here, and they're all type A, hardwired American service men and women. I said, who can tell me what the world looks like? Again, this is 2008 at this point. What does the world look like in 2020? Now, that's pretty close right now, so five years away, but this, again, it was like eight, nine years ago, more. Actually, eight, yeah, seven years, uh, more than that, 12 years ago. I said, get it outside a, a budget cycle. What's the world look like? So we commissioned a study. We came up with something in about six months called the strategic appreciation. I don't know if we ever showed it to you, Benny. It's, it's unclassified, and it's just a very good jumping off point. We don't know back then whether it was right or wrong, but what, we, what it was, it was a, a, a country, regional, and global study of as much open source data as we could possibly get. We churned it with some of the best minds. Didn't spend a lot of money on it, but it was a fantastic document which at the very end of this period when they first presented it was really maybe a C minus product. So we took it out to industry, we took it out to other countries, we took it out to think tanks, we said, look, no stake of ego here. We don't care what you think of it, help us make it better. Help us understand what the world is gonna look like in the future. And after doing that for about another six months or so, what happened? We came back with a much better product, still about maybe a B minus. Not going not gonna to know the future. I mean, if I did, I would be investing heavily in something, which I'm not. I'm investing in this. And I think the reason I'm investing in this is because what we found out, and this is, not, this is not rocket science at all. It's not brain surgery. We found out that generally from south to north, maybe east to west, 
Migration, extremism, and crime and criminality will come together to challenge the less governed spaces. And I turn to the guy who presents this to me, my strategic planner, a guy named uh, Joe Miller. He's still there. And I look at Joe Miller and I said, wait a minute. Is this today or is this in the future? And his answer was, yes. And the response should be funny, except it's not. Because we haven't done anything about it. The answer is still yes. It is today. And that's what he said. We had this discussion about it is today, but it's also into the future. This is going to continue. And while we work under the rule of law and graduated response and rehearsed responses to rules of engagement and whatever might happen, the other people, even with their own codified laws, selectively ignore them when it achieves their end results tactically, and they don't care about the strategic outcome. We had a great conversation, Miller and I did, completely different, is if a terrorist has a nuclear weapon or even something like a dirty bomb, he's a terrorist. Can you deter a terrorist? The deterrence is based on holding hostage a population or a capital or something they hold dear. But if a terrorist doesn't hold anything dear, can you deter them? Tough question. I think not. I think you can't. I think that's why you have to have more constraint on who gets what and where the technology goes. But other people in the United States government believe you can. Well, they couldn't answer how. They just say it's a belief. So if terrorists, forget the nuclear part now, so if terrorists, even with their own articulated laws, they don't follow them, can pick and choose what they want, when they want, conveniently, it kind of puts them, and this is a terrible analogy, but it puts them in a video game with no repercussions but go ahead to reboot whenever it gets too bad for them. And I don't think this really came on to me until I started having very good, honest, open discussions with Tal Russo and Betty, probably, I think, you know, back in two, around 2006, 7, right around then when we started what we called the Special Opera, the Senior Officer Professional Development. We worked bilaterally, U.S. Special Operations Command, and specifically the senior level of the IDF. We started to openly understand the challenges, and that made us grow that much more. But that's my greatest concern, and that's why I'm here today. To be part of this, had no idea it was the inaugural, that makes it that much more exciting, that much more, I think, important. But to take on this challenge of how do we redefine, and, and I've got one more quick story where Admiral Fallon asked me, he was then the commander of Pacific Command, I was getting ready to leave, and he was getting ready to leave too, and he asked me one time very pointedly, could I go someplace to a village in the Philippines? And he pointed to a table full of pictures. And he said, do you know what that is? And I said, sir, I do. And he said, do you know where it is? I said, I know what's there, I know who's there. Can you go there and kill them? I said, I can. But I'll shorten the story a lot. I told him how we would do it. I told him what the outcome would be. And I told him that he would never ask me to do that. Now, uh, again, I was a one-star at the time. He was a four-star. He was shocked because you don't talk like, especially a Navy guy. They don't talk, their culture is different. Yeah. <laughs> Can you turn that off? It's too late, isn't it? Okay, that's all right. Yeah, it's all right. So I said, hey, so you're never going to ask me to do that. I said, I can do it. Here's how I'll do it. And he understood that, I, that we could do it. It would be very successful or reasonably successful. But at the end of the day, I said, you won't ask me to do it. He said, why not? I said, because it will change the military, the diplomatic, uh, and the informational dynamic throughout the entire Pacific region for the next 40 years, regardless of the outcome. And he slumped in his chair, and he looked at me, and he said, okay, because four stars always get the last you know, say, and he says, okay, so how are you going to do it? I said, I'll do it by training them. It'll take longer. Give me some strategic patience but we'll, we'll get it done. And in, in, in almost two years to the day, we got it done. And I don't mind saying that I, I believe, and I say this publicly all the time, that you know, certain, certain people, certain men deserve to die because of what they've done. 
I'm not that judge, but I'll facilitate that. And I think under the guise of righteousness and the fact that there are rules of law that we follow that we don't break, no matter how much you'd like to, because that just makes you as bad as them. It's not what you want to do. But we do need the best legal minds helping us through, influencing the decision makers today and tomorrow into the future with a way forward and how we're going to get there. Because if not, we give it up to them all the time, and our worlds are going to be ever shrinking. I tell a lot of my friends, if they've never been to Israel, they need to come. And the reason they need to come, they need to feel the country. They need to see and visit the people. They need to get the truth. And they need to see how it feels like to be oppressed, not inside but outside, for all those many years and still live a vital life and still lead the way for freedom in this area, in this region. I don't think they quite understand it. My friends in the IDF, and I, and I don't use that term flippantly, my friends in the IDF were nice enough never to say to my face after we've been prosecuting the war on terror for a decade plus, so now do you know how it feels to Americans? Americans still don't quite get it. We're shielded a lot by the media. We don't always get the truth. We don't understand the impact. That's the importance of this. As you say, if not us, who? If not now, when? Now is the time to start. Thank you for inviting me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take about a 10-minute coffee break.